been here at Bethel um, looking at covenant. And what does it mean, a covenant-keeping God? What does it mean to be a covenant people? And um, what are these covenants that are all through the Word of God? There's lots of covenants. We've, we've been looking at five of them. Um, Pastor David, in his messages, has um, introduced us to the idea of covenant and, and um, the, the covenant that God made with Noah and then that it extended to the whole world. Um, what a wonderful thing that God has promised. He's never going to destroy the earth again by water, by a flood. There'll be a day when everything that's defiled will be washed up in fire, but it will only be for the new and wonderful thing that's coming forth. But he's promised that he will never destroy the earth again by fire. I mean, by, by uh, water. And he put the bow in the, the rainbow in the sky to announce that covenant with Noah. Then we go on in the Old Testament, in the, in the book of Genesis, and read about this man called Abram, who's called out of idolatry. He grew up in idolatry. His father was an idol maker, Terah, and he was in a very wicked kingdom. Um, it, they were... They were very rebellious against God in the kingdom of, really, it was Ur of Chaldees, but it was sort of where Babylon, the whole initial real formation of false worship began. And we see that uh, Abram had a heart to know the true God. And, um, and he began uh, to develop this relationship with God. God knew his heart, and God met with him and began to lead him. And they were called out of that place and he was called on a journey. He didn't know where he was going, but he was following God. And because of his faith and the different points in his life where he met challenges, but God would give him words and God would give him instructions, and he trusted God because he became a friend of God, the Bible says, that he would move by faith. And in that, God chose him as a man who through him and his descendants, God would reveal himself to all the nations, to all of history. So we heard about the Abram, Abrahamic covenant, which actually has promised the land of Israel, uh, has promised the promised land to the descendants of Abraham, specifically those that came through the lineage of Isaac and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. We know the story that... Um, Jacob had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, his name was obviously changed to Israel. That's why they're called the tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of the sons was sold into slavery into Egypt. Well, in God's plan, we know that God sent Joseph ahead of his brothers and his family so that God could bless him in Egypt and so that they could be spared in a time of famine and the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, went down into Egypt to join their brother Joseph. They were reconciled. You all know the story of the broken family relationships and how they were reconciled. Well, they enjoyed great prosperity in Egypt for many years, and they multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and became so large in number that Pharaoh and the rulers of Egypt began to be afraid of them. And so we know that they subjected them to slavery and in that time, um, it was a, the slavery went from bad to worse. Um, it became more and more oppressive because Pharaoh and the leaders of Egypt became more and more afraid of the, Egypt, I mean, of the Israelites because the more they oppressed them, the more they prospered in God. And so um, where we're beginning today is in the midst of this, um, there's a man and a woman who are faithful to God, who are slaves in Egypt, and they have a son named Moses. And Moses is born at a time that Pharaoh is so threatened, he's said, that all of the babies that are born to the Israelites, all the baby boys, are to be drowned in the river. Because that way, they could absorb these people, the girls would marry Egyptians, and they could absorb them into their culture, and they wouldn't be so threatening to them. Well, we know the story of Moses' mom and dad putting him in the little basket and um, pre preserving his life, how God 
arranged for that, and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, who had compassion on him, took him to be raised in Pharaoh's palace, and um, he grew up, and yet he had this fire burning in his heart that he was to be a deliverer for his people. And in his fiery ambition, he went out and tried to do it his own way and his own timing and ended up in trouble. He ended up killing a, uh, an Egyptian, and he um, had to flee for his life because he was found out. So here's a man who believed he was born for greatness, he was to deliver God's people, and now he has had to flee to the far side of the desert. He's gone, actually he meets the Midianites, and he ends up marrying a Midianite woman, um, and he's in a different place, he's away from his family, he's in the middle of a wilderness watching over sheep. To him it felt like he'd lost his destiny. Um, but God had other plans, and we'll see that about who this covenant-keeping God is. When he's in covenant with us, he doesn't break his covenant. We might break it. We disobey sometimes. Israel would disobey. But God didn't break his covenant with them. His covenants are eternal. We need to know that, that the covenants from the very beginning they are God-ordained. The reason they're eternal is because he's the always self-existent God. He's always been and he always will be. And covenant comes from him. He's the originator of these covenants, these biblical covenants. And he's also, he happens to be the ratifier. He's the one that seals it. If you remember the story of Abraham and the burning fiery pot, if you read that when we were doing our fast and reading the different stories about covenant in the Old Testament, when he actually did an act with Abraham um, to show him that he was making covenant with him, he, he did a ritual that was very familiar to Abram. He knew what it meant to, to cut covenant with uh, another man. They would sacrifice animals. Blood was involved. There was these promises. I'll take care of you if you take care of me. It was a lifetime commitment that they'd make in these covenants. God reached him in something he could understand. It, with, a, with a picture he could understand. And remember the, the animals were cut and that fiery pot moved down. The fire of God moved down through the middle. In essence saying, I'm walking this. I'm going to keep this with you, Abram. Well, so here's Abram. I mean, here's Moses now, fast forward generations. Moses is watching his sheep in the wilderness. And at one point, he goes to um, a mountain. And on the mountain, there's a burning bush. And this burning bush is not being consumed. There's a fire in the bush, and he turns aside to see why this is. And when he turns aside, all of a sudden, the presence of the Lord is there. And the Lord tells him, take off your shoes, Moses. The place you're standing is holy ground. It's interesting. Moses, at that time, is terrified. But God reassures him. He said, oh, Moses, I am the God of your fathers. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then he goes farther, and he reveals a new name. He reveals himself as I am. It's in his conversation with Moses, because he asks Moses to go and to deliver the children of Israel. And Moses says, oh, what makes you think I can do that? I failed. I'm, you know, I'm just a, a guy in the wilderness watching sheep. And the Lord tells him, no, you go, and I'll be with you. You haven't lost your destiny. Your destiny still is here because I'm a covenant-keeping God. So Moses is hard to convince because he's afraid. He has no confidence in himself at this point. But God tells him uh, he has authority from him, and he gives him a rod, and he's to exercise his authority by faith. Remember how we focused on faith last week? Faith is the key. God's not looking for the person who's going to impress him with their performance. He will be impressed when he sees us yielding to him and what he can do through us. But that's not because we 
are doing it in our own strength or we're impressing him. That's not what pleases God. What pleases God is when people will respond to his, his invitation of love. From the very beginning, <clears throat> from the Garden of Eden, his invitation has been love towards these humans who he created. And he created them for great destiny. And he created them and, and began to unfold this amazing, amazing plan. And it's been unfolding through one covenant after another covenant. He never annuls those covenants. He builds on them. Sometimes things change in the covenant. The details, like Pastor David had said, about the dietary change that took place between the Noah, uh, before Noah and after Noah. Sometimes there's a dietary change that takes place even between the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. There's things that change, like little details, but not the core of it. The core of it is an unfolding truth. And it's God who's moving through history to reveal himself to people who will respond. Chosen people. You know, this morning in a, a class that we had here, we talked about what is it that makes us chosen. What makes us chosen are the humans that he created who will respond to this invitation of love by loving in return. God is not looking for robots. He's not looking just for subjects that he can beat over the head and crack the whip over. God is looking for sons and daughters. He's looking for lovers. He's looking for those that will respond in humility, acknowledging he is the Lord God Most High. He's the self-existent God. He doesn't need us, but he's made himself vulnerable to need us. He has set it up so that he needs a response of love. That's what covenant is all about. We see it in our own human institutions in the covenant of marriage. It's a commitment that should be lifetime, and it's a commitment <clears throat> to love the other one selflessly and to work together, and, and God puts himself in that place of love where he, here he is, with all power. He has everything he needs. He's self-existent, but he wants love. He wants a loving response from those that he's created. Now, tragically, we see through history, not everybody responds in love to him. Not everybody wants him to be God. They respond sometimes to the deceiver who comes to deceive them and makes them think that they can be God. And they can define their own reality. Postmodern thought is so crazy. It's like if I say it enough, it'll be reality. But that doesn't change the laws of nature. Doesn't change the laws of the creator. But we have a creator who has set up everything to function a certain way. And he has a plan to invite us in to his uh, plan, his kingdom that we would be a part of it, partners with him, sons and daughters who would inherit the whole thing. But there's a way to go. There's a way to enter. And it's through humility and a response of love to the king. So back to Moses. You know, it's an interesting thing. When Moses um, is at the burning bush, at that point, the Bible calls it Mount Horeb, H-O-R-E-B, um, but we will see that actually that becomes Mount Sinai. And this is the scene of the Mosaic Covenant, which I'm talking about today. Actually, I think I'm going to read some portions from Exodus 3 just to set it in place so that I can make my point about um, something that happens as we go through this story. So we see that Moses is before the burning bush. God's taken, told him to take off his shoes. And the Lord said, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land and to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. He's going to give them the land he promised to Abram. Abraham now. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, 
And I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. So come now, therefore, and I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But then Moses says to God, who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve and worship God on this mountain. So he's at Mount Horeb, and from there he, we know the story. And then he introduces himself to him, because Moses says, well, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, well, tell me his name, what shall I say? And God said to Moses, Declare to them, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so Moses goes and he goes through um, all of the trials <laughs> in Egypt. We know the story of the 10 plagues. Pharaoh's not really eager to let them go. Um, but God is going to display himself as the great I am. He's the Lord over nature. He's the Lord over all false gods. And he is the Lord that will deliver his people because he's compassionate and loving and he's heard their cry and he's in covenant with them. So we know the story. They go through this amazing confrontation with the Egyptians. It's horrifying to see the plagues. I would just mention here that as you read the book of Revelation, we will see similar plagues in the end times that will come to try to convince people to turn to God. Um, but it is, the plagues came to judge the false gods. They had deceived these people in Egypt to make them think that they were gods, and God came in every one of those plagues. He put a false god to shame. So when we get to the end, and finally there's the the culmination, which ends in Passover, we know the story of Passover. It's a horrifying event in many ways because all the firstborn of Egypt are, are killed. But it is an event of covenant. It is an event where God says, those of you who fear me, those of you who want my protection, this is what you have to do. And they were instructed to slay the Passover lamb and to put the blood over the, uh, the lentil and the doorposts of their house. And if it was there, because they'd acted by faith, remember this is by faith, they acted by faith, they were spared that terrible plague. And so Pharaoh rose up and said, get out of here, we can't have this. It was terrifying, because everything, even animals died during that time. It was a horrifying thing. And so we know the children of Israel got up and they fled. And as they fled, um, they encountered many trials, but God displayed his power over rulers of the earth and over nature itself. We know that when Pharaoh followed him, we sang about it this morning, and when Pharaoh would pursue them at the Red Sea, the Red Sea parted. But how did it part? It parted as Moses responded in faith with the people, the children of Israel, and he held up his rod of authority because he was obeying what God told him to do. And in that, the waters parted. God showed up. God showed off. <laughs> Moses showed up. <laughs> and, but God showed off. And the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea. But when Pharaoh pursued them, the Red, the Red Sea closed and drowned Pharaoh's armies, washing away the chariots and the horses and the people, the riders, and wiping out those that were pursuing them, delivering them to safety. Now, this was a huge event that sent shockwaves through all the nations around. Pharaoh, the great ruler, Egypt, the powerful kingdom. Oh, my goodness, these people, these children of Israel have a God on their side like we've never seen before. A display of the glory of God that was to bring light to the nations. This was the calling of Israel. So in order to talk about the Mosaic Covenant, it takes place at a mountain. And it's the very mountain where the burning bush was. 
It's Mount Sinai. But remember, this is a worship experience. They had told Pharaoh, God had instructed him to, Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can come out and worship me. This is a worship experience at Mount Sinai, a terrifying experience. God meets with this new nation of Israel. The 12 tribes have multiplied, and it's a huge host of people. And they have people with them that aren't even from the, tribe, the, the tribes of Israel. They've got a mixed multitude that goes with them. There were Egyptians who knew God was with Israel and went with them. And so they have a huge mass of people who are going to be formed into this nation Israel that will take possession of the promised land. So they come to Mount Sinai, and God meets with the nation there and meets with these people there. It's a terrifying experience with lightning and thunder and fire on this mountain. It's interesting, the word senna is um, a word for bush. It's like a thorny bush. And many people believe them, that Mount Sinai is a derivative of that because it's the same letters, senna um, and Sinai. And it's interesting, the little burning bush becomes a burning mountain. It becomes a blazing fire as God comes down to the top of this mountain in his presence to show them that he's with them and also to announce to them he wants to make a covenant with them. They already know that they're part of the Abrahamic covenant. They already know they're part of the Noah covenant, but he's got some more details to give them because they have need at this point in history to have more details about it. And um, there are laws that are going to be given to them. They're going to be brought from just wandering people into a nation that will be able to take the promised land and keep it. That's God's goal. His goal for them is that they would be able to come into this land and actually inherit it. And so if, if you look at the laws that go with this covenant, you see that it's all about training up a people that can take the land and hold the land and inherit the land. Because the, God knows that the enemy comes with cunning schemes. And he lays out a system of ways that they're to live so that they can protect themselves from the deceptions that had taken over the other nations. God knew what had happened at the time of Adam and his descendants. He, he knew what had happened when the enemy had deceived the people of the nations and they got to such a terrible place that there was murder and violence all around and horror and destruction. And he had to destroy the people except save Noah's family. He didn't want that to happen with the nation of Israel. He needed a called out people who had a structure to hedge them in. And that's what the laws of the of the new covenant, the Mosaic covenant is about. It's not about jumping through hoops to please God. It's not about earning their salvation. They already had salvation. They'd been saved by the Passover. They'd been rescued and delivered. This doesn't bring salvation to the people of God. This brings them a hedge of protection. It brings them an order so that they can fulfill what they've been called to do. That's always God's ways. He's not interested in a religious system that is all legalistic where we're jumping through hoops. What he's interested in is a people's heart who's after him, who understand he has wisdom to share with us. He has ways to go because he's the creator and he knows how things work. And so when he gives the blessings and curses, it's not because he wants to bring curses on them. He's giving him insider information. I'm the creator. I know how things work. If you will do these things and follow my commandments, if you'll see what I'm doing, read my heart and follow me and follow my direction, you'll be blessed. You'll be the most blessed people in the whole earth. But if you don't, I have to tell you, you're going to live under a curse. And the curses are going to come in on you like they've come in on the other nations, only even worse because the devil really hates you because he knows I've chosen you to be my people. So it was a warning. It was a warning to, to protect this nation and to protect these people, as it is a warning for us today. Holiness, a call to holiness, a call to God's order is mercy from God. It's insider information. It's like you want to be blessed, come under my umbrella of protection. Get to know me. Follow my ways. Don't do it because you think I'm snapping a whip over your head. 
come to me. Get to know me. I love you. I want to give you everything. I want to give you the kingdom. Come to me and yield humbly. Learn my ways. Then we can defeat the enemy of your soul together. Then we can throw out those traps and those that have come to kill, steal, and destroy against you. It's of utmost importance that we see that the laws of the covenant, the laws of this covenant, were given to direct, protect, and bless Israel. They were not given as a means of salvation. This covenant stands because God is faithful. If you read the story about Israel, you know that Israel fails many times. They were imperfect people just like we are. But God is faithful even when we're unfaithful. Timothy, uh, two, 2 Timothy 2.13 says that. You know, even when we're unfaithful, God is faithful because he cannot deny himself. Israel will suffer the consequences of disobedience. We see that. When they disobey and they move out from under the protection of God and they go their independent way and think their own thoughts about how they want to live their lives, they think they know better than God or maybe they get bedazzled by the nations around them and the false gods around them, we see that they suffer. But it's not because God wants them to suffer. He's always there calling them back to himself to return to him, to repent and come back. It's always about um, the, the, the suffering that goes on, the consequences of disobedience to these laws actually serve to help bring the people back on track. And yet, even when they disobey, the covenant is not annulled. God still, it's an eternal covenant and he will not break it. In fact, he says it at a time in Israel's history when they're in great danger. In Jeremiah 31, he's, this is long time after the um, nation of Israel has matured, and they've gone into terrible idolatry, and the nor they've split by a civil war. The northern kingdom gets taken off by the Assyrians captive, and the southern kingdom has come to its end, too, uh, in, in disobedience to God. And Babylon is going to come in and destroy the temple and take them captive because they've chosen to get out of that protection of God. And as a result, um, they lost a lot of things. But even in the midst of it, God, through the prophet Jeremiah, reassures them, I have not, your covenant is not broken. You might go down to Babylon for a little while, but... You seek me there, and I'll bless you there. You'll still be a light to the nations. And after a certain amount of time, I'm going to bring you back if you'll follow me. And he reassures them even as he's warning them of what they're going to get because of what they did. He's already reassuring them, you can't break this covenant in the sense of I'm not going to break it. It's a covenant that stands for those who will humbly submit to me and respond to me in love. So what does the Mosaic Covenant mean to us? I think you've probably been putting it together. It's the same thing for us today. Jesus was very clear in Matthew 17, I mean, Matthew 5, in verses 17 um, through 19, he says, and I'll get it out here so I can read it. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. For assuredly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle, those are little marks on the words um, in Hebrew, not one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. And whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so to do, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a pretty tall order. And we know, we've, we've heard the sermons before about what this means. God is now going to write his law on our hearts. It's still about our heart response. It's about a humble people that want to please God, not so that they can get his favors, 
But because they love him, and he loves them, and he's so gracious and good, they want to please him because he's captured their hearts. And so he's written these laws on their hearts. When they first come to Sinai and the laws are given, they're terrified. I'm not going to go into it because we don't have all the time that I thought I was going to read some of the portions of, of Scripture. But you can read it yourself. Exodus 19 is a great place to read, to see the scene. Exodus 24 is another place. You, get a, a, you kind of, uh, it captures that scene where heaven opens up and God deals with these people. But it's important for us to realize that in the midst of this, um, one of the first things he does after they meet, he meets with them and, and they're terrified and, and Moses talks with God. He gives them the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are kind of the ethical center of the law, but the children of Israel already knew the Ten Commandments. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they lived that way. They knew it was wrong to dishonor their parents. They knew it was wrong to murder. They knew it was wrong to steal. They knew it was wrong to lie. They knew they shouldn't have any other God before him. But this was like a stake in the ground. This is the core, and now we're going to build and add to it. And so we see that God gives them this. But in the midst of it, one of the most interesting things is he calls them as they stand before him, and Moses puts it to them. God is asking, do you want to be his covenant people? Do you want to enter into this covenant and be this nation? And the people say, yes. Yes, we do. And all that he says, we will do. They said it a couple times at different times. And it's interesting what he called them to be. He called them to be a kingdom of priests. They were going to be a, ch a chosen people, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like our calling? A, a royal priesthood, a chosen people. That is a, a scripture from the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are chosen, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and spot. The picture is there. What God was unfolding to the nation of Israel as they were in the wilderness, and they were going to have to be in the wilderness for 40 years because they didn't respond in faith when he led them up to the promised land the first time. They got afraid, they operated in fear, and they could not take the promised land in fear. Fear, folks, get rid of fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Draw close to God if fear is hounding you because you can't get the things of the kingdom by fear. You get the kingdom, you get the kingdom promises. You get everything from God by faith. It's the opposite of fear, and faith works by love, the Bible says. It's a loving relationship. It's trusting that what God says he means and stepping out, even if it looks scary, even maybe the water isn't parted yet, but you raise that rod of authority and you step out because you know he loves you, and he will not leave you, and he will not give you up. And so there's messages here in this whole Mosaic Covenant. It's amazing as you start to read it, and you read it again and again. And yes, it is hard <laughs> to read in our culture sometimes. We read some of these things, and you're like, woo, that's kind of strong. Like one of them, I think, is, you know, about the rebellious child. You're supposed to stone him to death. You're like, woo, glad my dad wouldn't do that. But, you know, you think about it. It's because there was a line being drawn in the sand, God knew that the rebellious child was on a path of destruction. It was to be a picture in front of their eyes. If you go into rebellion, you got an enemy who's going to kill you. And how many tragedies do we see in the news today because kids rebel against their parents? How many die or get, they suffer because they are in a spirit of rebellion against authority? 
kids are killed by overdosing drugs. They're killed by drunk driving. They're killed by rage because of a love affair that's gone wrong and you get murder-suicide. Because the devil prowls around looking to try to destroy people because he knows God has called people to be his people and to bring heaven to earth. And so he comes after us in any cunning way he can. So this covenant applies to us in the sense of we want to understand the principles. We want to see the heart behind it. And we want to rejoice that we've been grafted in. Now, we know that Jesus fulfilled this covenant. We know that our, actually our standard's a little higher than this. Our standard's about the thoughts and intentions of our heart, Jesus says. If you so much as say you hate your brother or you hate somebody, you're the same as a murderer, according to Jesus. If you look at a woman lustfully or anybody lustfully, it's like you've already committed adultery. Because God has come. He's paid the price. He is the Passover lamb. He, we are now in this place of history as these covenants have unfolded. And we are in the place where we are realizing the blessings of this, that there were faithful ones who went before, even when they couldn't really see but they faithfully followed, and they were a light to the nations, and they passed it from one generation to another. This is why we honor the Jewish people, because they passed it on, even imperfectly. Yes, we're imperfect too, and we have a better, a better covenant. And, but they passed it on, and in that righteous line came Messiah and fulfilled it perfectly. He never broke the law. Amazing. Never broke the law. He fulfilled it perfectly so he could then be the sacrifice lamb and pay the price for all of the world's sin from beginning to end. There's no excuse for not coming in to the kingdom of God because everything's been paid and the arms are wide open by God and he invites us in. So today we have a choice. There's a lot more information here. I could go on and on, but it's late. But we have a choice. If you've never entered into this covenant with Jesus, covenant with God made possible through the death of Jesus, I want to invite you to step in and come and get to know the God who created you, who loves you, and who has an amazing plan for your life that you don't have a clue about, but he will unfold to you. Israel had no idea. Poor Moses, he had no idea what was going to happen when he went into Egypt, but it unfolded, and God did not disappoint him. God showed up and showed off. And, and so if you've never entered into this covenant that God wants you to enter into through the shed blood of Jesus, I invite you today, come up and pray with someone and receive Jesus as your Savior. And when you do, you get sealed by the presence of God himself, his Holy Spirit in your heart. You know, at the, at the foot of Sinai, they were sealed by sprinkled blood. They, they made a sacrifice and sprinkled the people with blood. It was a sealing of that covenant at Sinai. Well, when we come by faith to Jesus, we get covered by the blood, washed in the blood of the Lamb. We receive that full righteousness of Christ. It's amazing. It doesn't make any sense. We have to receive it by faith. It's always by faith. But maybe we're just people who haven't really Maybe we are saved. Maybe we've accepted this and we're a part of his family. We're a part of the chosen people, but we're not living that way. And our lives don't line up. It's because we've seen God is hard. We've seen him snapping a whip over our head. And our lives are all out of order and we're suffering the consequences. God just says, come, ask forgiveness, return to me. Get in the word. I'll show you the way to go. It's all about faith. God has given to every man a measure of faith. Now, what do you do with it? And how do you exercise faith? Well, we know that the Lord says faith works by love. It's as we love God and as he shows us how to move. But we also know we can feed our faith. How do we feed our faith? We feed it with the word of God. There's nothing more precious than the word of God. Daily, the children of Israel were fed manna every morning. And it wasn't enough to last for the whole week. They had to get it every day, except for the Sabbath, where God gave them enough so they didn't have to do work on the Sabbath. But God wants us to eat his word so that we get to know him. And the Holy Spirit will teach us and show us that we might be those covenant people. 
It's interesting that that place at Sinai where he calls them to be a kingdom of priests, it's the first time the word kingdom is mentioned in the Bible. That's significant. We are a fuller manifestation of that kingdom. We need to align with the principles of God that we might fulfill that kingdom mandate. And God is here today to meet us. And the invitation is open and his love is flowing. Father, I thank you for what amazing God you are. I thank you for every person here. I thank you that you are moving amongst us. You were moving with us in, in worship. I felt like we'd come before you in worship today to meet with you and to receive from you what we need for this season. God, we're a holy people, a chosen holy people purchased by the blood of Jesus, called out ones to display your glory in the earth to be a blessing wherever we go, that they might see who you are. And you've, you've made it possible through salvation and through the gift of Holy Spirit that comes and dwells with us and through your precious word. I pray, Lord, that we would step up, that we would come and we would respond to you, God, and that you would have your way in our lives and that you could clear our vision so we could get an unfolding picture why were we, were we created? What are the gifts that you put in us that you want to manifest your glory through? What is it, Lord? Day by day as we eat your word and follow you and love you and get to know you better, you'll show us and you'll form us and you'll shape us. And yes, Lord, those things that are impossible for us will become possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you today for this amazing gift. I thank you that you're a covenant-keeping God. And Lord, we declare we want to be covenant-keeping people. We want to be people in covenant with you and with one another that we might see the kingdom of God manifest. We might see heaven brought to earth. And we might see the glory of the Lord touch every sphere of our lives. We love you and we praise you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.